All right. Good afternoon to those of you here with us in Berlin. Good morning to those of you across an ocean. Good evening to those of you across another ocean. And good tidings, no matter where you are in space and time. We've just been watching Patricia Dominguez and uh, Nicole Lequillier's uh, Leche Holographica, fascinating film to help us meditate today on day two of Transmedial's Symposium of 2022 for Refusal. And uh, my name is Max Haven. I'm Canada Research Chair in the Radical Imagination at Lakehead University. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, a very uh, exciting panel titled IOU Capital Debts and Promise. And I'm joined by three and perhaps hopefully four uh, guests today, which I'm going to introduce you to in a short moment here. Um, today, we're going to be discussing topics of debt, who owes what to whom, who ought not to owe what to whom, what debts are recognized, what debts go unrecognized, what debts uh, open up new possibilities, and what debts take vengeance. Um, I'm going to introduce you to our guests to begin with, and then I'm going to uh, play out for you briefly, by way of introduction, the kind of questions that I've posed to them uh, to guide our discussion today. I posed to them three different questions that delineate the question of what it means to make work, to make culture, to make art, uh, and to be human, or whatever human has been eclipsed by, in an age of unpayable debts. I've also asked them to think a little bit with us about the aesthetics of refusal of debt and also the economies of refusal of debt. And I'll come to those questions in a second. Uh, but first, I'm going to give you their biographies and let you get to know them quickly. Um, now, Dele Edeyemo uh, is joining us remotely. However, there are problems with the connection. So uh, it's our hope that uh, Dele will be able to join us. But let me tell you a little bit about Dele first. Dele is an architect and urban theorist conducting a Chase AHRC funded PhD at the Center for Research Architecture at Goldsmiths University of London. His research intersects black studies with urban studies to question how the rise of logistics is driving the processes of urbanization. Positioning slavery as the ghost in the machine of logistics, Dele explores how circulations established in transatlantic slavery at the foundation of modernity live on in the contemporary production of space. His work mobilizes a black aesthetic through writing, film, and attention to movement and oral sensation in order to unsettle the machine and the machinic fantasies of logistics to reveal its fleshy underpinnings. Um, so in a moment, I'll ask Dele to give a, a brief presentation by way of an introduction. But first, I want to introduce you to our other panelists as well, who are here with me in Berlin. Ahmed, uh, Ahmed uh, Issam al -Din is a visual artist, designer, and blogger from Khartoum. He studies physics at studied physics at University of Khartoum and graphic design and photography in Cairo and visual com uh, communication at Weissensee uh, Kunsthaus School here in Berlin. His focus practices on immigration and psychology, the processes of revolutions, decolonial design and technology, and he's participated in various exhibits between Khartoum, Cairo, and Berlin and is currently studying new media at the Universität der Kunst here in Berlin. Welcome. Uh, Bahar Nurezadeh is a filmmaker, a writer, a platform, and a platform designer. She works on reformulation of hegemonic time narratives as they collapse in the face of speculation. Philosophical, financial, legal, futural, etc. Nurezadeh is the founder of Weird Economies, an excellent online art platform that traces economic imaginaries extraordinary to financial arrangements of our time. Her work has also appeared in many venues, including the German Pavilion of the Venice uh, Architecture Biennale of 2021 and the Tate Modern Artists Cinema Program. And she is pursuing her work as a PhD candidate in art at Goldsmiths University of London, where she holds a Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada doctoral fellowship. Welcome. And Gary uh, Zexi Zhang is an artist and researcher based in London. Last year, his solo presentation, Cycle 25, was co-commissioned by Arts Catalyst and Block Projects. His work has been featured in exhibitions and screenings at venues, including the Douglas Hyde Gallery, Parasite, and Ming Contemporary Art Museum, and the Venice Architecture Biennale. His writing appears regularly in Freeze Magazine and occasionally in publications, including the MIT Journal of Design and Science, Verge Journal, and Art Review. Zhang is a founding member of the collaborative research studio Foreign Objects and resident at Somerset House Studios. And he's sometimes an adjunct lecturer at the Parsons School of Design. Welcome and welcome to all of you. 
Dele, we, we see you now. Uh, it's nice to have you with us. Let me, uh, Hi. before Hi, we go... Hello, hello. So let me begin by just um, laying out some of, the, some of the terms that we've been discussing as a panel for our conversation today. And I think many of us have been deeply influenced by the work of Denise Ferreira da Silva and uh, da Silva's forthcoming book uh, from Sternberg Press, uh, Unpayable Debt. Uh, in that book, De Silva speaks in many valences about this question of a debt that's unpayable. And one of those valences is a debt that one is called upon to repay, that, but which one should not have to pay, but yet which one has to pay, and yet which cannot be paid. Um, and here I think there's a number of examples from around the world that many of our panelists will sort of bring up in their conversation, but I want to mention a few of them. One of them that I've been thinking with recently is the uh, odious debt that has been forced on the American colony of Puerto Rico in the wake of first the kind of financial extractive empire imposed upon that island for a kind of kleptocratic global financial oligarchy that used it as essentially a piggy bank to leverage uh, debt uh, and uh, hide and move money around the world, and has now bloomed into a full-scale humanitarian crisis in the wake of uh, hurricanes and earthquakes. This is a debt that Puerto Rico should not have to pay, and yet a debt that it is forced to pay. And I want to I want to honor all of the social movements on that island or that archipelago, I should say, who are resisting and suggesting that in fact and refusing this debt and suggesting this debt should is is both unpayable but should have never been incurred in the first place. But this debt is only the latest example, perhaps not even the latest example, of a long line of imperial and colonial debt politics that have seen the uh, merger. Of on the one hand, a kind of white supremacist vision of an economy that Sylvia Winter identifies with the kind of rule of what she calls man two, uh, homo economicus, uh, alongside the kind of capitalist apparatus and colonial apparatus as well. We can think about the debts leveraged over the last uh, seven decades, really, by the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank that have in so many ways encumbered the nations of the global south, for the most part, with unpayable debts that then do incredible violence when imposed on the actual populations and constraining and reshaping the ways in which governments and governmentality is exercised. And we have as perhaps one of the prototypical debts there, the odious debt that was forced upon Haiti itself in the wake of its liberation, its people's liberation from the yoke of French enslavement and the transatlantic slave trade, the first uh, truly democratic revolution in world history for which the colonial powers could never forgive them. An odious debt that by some estimates continues to this day and continues to force Haiti into a position of being the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere by standard economic measurements. And yet, of course, we know also from the work of David Graeber, which was cited earlier today, that this debt of which we're speaking is not only a financial debt, not only an economic debt, but also a debt that operates on the level of morality. And here, morality is not simply a matter of personal morality. It's a matter of political ethics, which is to say a matter of how the global economic and political system, the regimes of racial capitalism, or global racial empire, as our last guest uh, indicated, is shaped by a sense of who is not only in debt for moral and economic crimes, but also who is in debt for uh, the gift of civilization that allegedly colonialism bestowed. There's a sense that De Silva speaks about that there's an unpayable debt that's imposed upon what Vijay Prashad calls the darker nations for even having been the subject of colonialism itself, a kind of debt that haunts the imagination around the world and that proves itself very difficult to liberate oneself again and again. So on the one hand, we have what we might term debts, unpayable debts from above. And these are debts that we all acknowledge exist, the debts that are uh, brokered by the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, the kinds of debts that are uh, imposed increasingly on students around the world for the cost of obtaining an education, the kind of debts that are leveraged through the global financial apparatus, debts that we all know exist and that are often functionally unpayable by those upon whom they've been imposed. And yet also if we have these unpayable debts from above that everyone acknowledges that cannot be paid and yet are still enforced, there are perhaps also those unpayable debts from below. And here I have in mind the unpayable debts 
that might be demanded through strategies of uh, reparations climate reparations, reparations for the transatlantic slave trade, reparations for colonialism, debts that are owed by those who have money and power in this world and yet go consistently unacknowledged, go silenced, go buried within the global apparatus in which we find ourselves. So I've begun by asking our panel to if, if they might situate their work and their thinking in a world dominated by these two forms of unpayable debt, the unpayable debt from above and the unpayable debt from below as I frame them, or if they wish to refuse even that framing. And that's where I've asked them to begin, but I want to give you a brief preview of where this conversation is going, because I know some of our uh, panelists are going to begin by answering several questions at once. So that was the first question, is how do you, how do you position yourself between these unpayable debts from above and below? Or, or does this terminology work for you? The second question I'm going to ask them, uh, and we may come back to it in a few moments, is what's the role of aesthetics here? What are the aesthetics of refusal of these unpayable debts? And here, aesthetics has, of course, many valences, this strange term that we've been bestowed. Uh, on the one hand, aesthetics, of course, speak to the nature of the senses. And so an aesthetics of refusal might, have, uh, might bring up the question of what it means to feel a sense of refusal, to, be, to have a sense of refusal come from your body, from your embodied presence. It might have to do with the affects of refusal, whether they're joyful, whether they're vengeful, whether they're hopeful, whether they're pessimistic. So the aesthetics of refusal, in some sense, is a question of the senses and the sensing body and the sensing social body, when we don't just think of bodies individually, but collectively. And then aesthetics also has, uh, brings up, of course, the question of representation and the question of who is represented and how, is re how they are represented. The question of refusing representations of the indebted subject, the questions of refusing representation of the, uh, the lending subject. So these questions of aesthetic are the second place where I want to see if we can go today to question the aesthetics of refusal. And more broadly than that, the question of what is art, what is the thing called art? What is its role in a global refusal of debt and the politics of unpayable debt? And then the third question I've posed to them today, which again, we may not hear immediately, but we'll come back to a little bit later, is what it may mean to be in and to be a catalyst of or to be a witness to an economy of refusal. And here an economy might not simply mean the way in which we uh, you know, account for uh, debts and credits within a global financial apparatus that's built quite literally on the ledgers that held the records of the, the fungibility of black life uh, as Tiffany Del Thabo King puts it, uh, in the origins of capitalism and the origins of the financial crisis. And it might not also be an economy that exists or expresses itself in the ledgers of empire built on the stolen war uh, wealth of people around the world. Here, an economy of refusal might mean the ways in which people come together to provide each other with mutual aid. It might mean the ways in which other economies might exist. It might even include a discussion of libidinal economies to draw on that psychoanalytic register as well. In other words, what I'm trying to ask our panelists to think through when we speak to, about economies of refusal is in some ways how we might learn to cooperate otherwise, how we might learn to create economies of provisioning and economies of exchange that exist against, within, and beyond the forms of uh, neo-colonial capitalist economies that we're forced to contend with. And so with these three questions in mind, first the question of how one situates oneself within this strange world, this strange dialectics, or if you prefer, tidalectics, to take up Antwi's reinterpretation of glissant, of unpayability from above and unpayability from below. And then second, this question of aesthetics, and third, this question of economies. I want to turn it now over to our panel. And I'd like to begin with uh, Dele, if you're, if you're ready to, to, uh, to give us your opening impulse. And then we'll move on from there. Thank you. Hello. Th thanks for that um, wonderful introduction, Max. Um, just checking. Can everyone hear me OK? Yeah. OK, fantastic. I'm sorry I can't be with people um, in Berlin. I'm, I'm over here in Accra. But in, um, in a sense, it's um, uh, given what I'm going to speak about, it's relevant to be here on the continent of Africa. Um, for myself, when we speak about unpayable debts, we have to speak about Africa. 
In answering the question, I want to think about the role that Africa's debt has played in the structuring of the geography of our global capitalist system. It's important that we counter notions that Africa is a space that follows Euro-American modernity. Instead, I would argue that due to legacies of slavery, colonialism, and neo-colonial debt arrangements, Africa can be understood as accelerated reality of a neoliberal condition emergent everywhere. This has profound implications on the spatial structure of capitalism and the new subject of capital's attention. Take, for example, the fashion film produced in 2019 by Nigeria's leading bank, GTB, in which we see an African youth culture center. Um, if the tech people can play, play the film with that sound. Are you guys able to see the film? Okay, here we go. The film begins with a cam aerial pan over Lagos. In the foreground, the cities, islands, connected by a network of motorways are impossibly deserted. The rocketing population of the megalopolis, along with famous congestion, and are all mysteriously gone. And this was shot pre-lockdown. The film sparks to life with a lively electro-afro beat and scene after scene produces apparitions of an African haute couture that make use of the city's infrastructures of circulation, appearing in locations usually teeming with the flow of bodies and commodities. These fashion spirits recall the terrific force and eccentric movements of the African masquerade. As the rising hustle and bustle of the city enters the film, we realize that these manifestations were the flat flights of fans and urban youth as they daydream going about their everyday business. With the caption at the end, fashion is freedom, GT Bank's film makes the simple statement that style is a route to free yourself from the chaos and stresses of the city and finance is your partner in achieving that dream. We see the importance of finance connecting with African youth in this in this film. Um, it's a fresh and exciting it, in its in its production, and it marks a change in approach in appealing to young consumers previously seen by banks as unreliable and insignificant creditors. But this is not a new story. Since the formation of transatlantic slavery, African consumers have been central to the creation and transformation of our world system. In recent years, there has been a growing appreciation that the transatlantic slave trade and our modern financial institutions were co-constitutive. What's less discussed is the centrality of the production of an African consumer fueled by credit to the supply of enslaved labor. As Baucom's work, Spectres of the Atlantic highlighted, credit didn't only follow the slave trade, enabling the purchase of slaves. Credit also produced by creating a class of debtors whose bodies and whose relations bodies functioned as their guarantee of last resort. So since transatlantic slavery, the geography of West Africa, at least, has not only been continually reconstituted as a new frontier in capital. The more profound effect has been the production of a perpetually indebted population whose bodies underwrite capitalism's globalizing network. We can therefore understand that Africans have been central to the world economy, not necessarily in terms of overall revenue, but because of the relationship of debt bondage produced through them that first supplied the norm for slaves and now uses human capital as a premise for development. In our current moment, projections such as McKinsey's report Lions on the Move make a case that due to Africa's demographics as the fastest urbanizing and youngest population in the world, global investors and businesses ought to be focusing on Africa as the next frontier of, go of growth, taking the place that Asia has played in, in the recent past. And structured by the trap of what Samir Amin termed as unequal exchange, Nigeria, for example, for decades has exported its oil and unskilled labor 
supporting value-added commodities and expertise, a relation that maintains the country in a stage of per perpetual development where a vast surplus value is transferred from perif the periphery of the world economy to the center, burdening new ger generations with a trade gap that can never be closed and a debt that can never be repaid. The result is a super dispossessed, underemployed population do, uh, through a series of survival circuits located in the subsistence economy. However, this has produced an interesting paradox. And this is the key point that I want to make here. As early as the 60s, the Nigerian Marxist thinker Esko Toyo observed that the nation's predatory impulse would not come from a workers' revolt, but from the peasant classes. As one of the fastest growing consumer sectors in the world, Nigeria's urban youth enjoy the distinguished position as both the precarious peasant class and also the principal focus of capital's attention as a new frontier for accumulation. And this is precisely the unique energy and critical danger to the establishment that the NSARS movement posed during the rainy season of 2020. The young people who GT Bank's film was appealing to were the very same youths organizing themselves against police brutality. The protest began as a refusal of a corrupt unit of the police force, but quickly became a refusal of the corrupt system that put that force in place. However, the moment the protesters began to criticize the corruption of government was the moment their refusal could no longer be tolerated. The protesters' refusal had inadvertently become the refusal of an obligation that was never theirs to pay, and by extension, a refusal of Africa's structural position of dependency. The Lekki Tolgate massacre that followed on the 20th October 2020, where at least 12 people were killed when a paramilitary government force opened fire on the peaceful protest, put an end to the NSARS movement. However, the state's recourse to spectacular violence only highlights the fact that a new generation, a new antagonistic consciousness had awakened in Africa. As global capitalism transforms, the balance between a precarious urban youth and an imperialist feudal comprador elite remains an increasingly fraught reality. And the success of refusal strategies in the future will hinge on how well we engage with the spirit of this new consciousness that has ar um, arised from, from below. So that, that would be my kind of initial response to, to your, your pitch about um, your question about refusal and, and strategies for refusal and where we, where we should be looking at for these new strategies of refusal to come from. Thank you so much. Um, that is a really, I think, profound and deeply thought-provoking uh, impulse. So yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, Ahmed, would you uh, share next? Uh, actually, yeah, I would like to, oh, thank you, Max, actually, for the questions. Thank you for the introduction. And also thank you, Delhi, because I actually want to take the camera a little bit to the east now. Uh, like moving it from the West Africa to East Africa, using different terminologies, but telling uh, another story or the same story, maybe, I don't know. So um, first, uh, let me add one type of unpayable debt worth mentioning here to understand the cycle of debt extraction. The form of debt, which Graeber called it imperial debt, the one used to repay the tools of violence to maintain the unpayable debt from above, which you described. I'm talking about the debt of the U.S. State Department, the state bonds, which petroleum rentier states like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Emirates started accumulating since the 70s. This facilitated army expansion, or lethal aid, as U.S. Uh, state Department call it. This form of debt produces the bills for the debt guardian, who maintained the autocratic order in the global south, reminding us the iron slave cycle. In the, of the 19th century's West Africa, when unenslaved people were exchanged with weapons, led some group to acquire tools of violence to maintain tribal tyranny and securing the slave market itself. 
I was born in Sudan in 1989. Uh, the external public debt in that year was $12 billion. By the time I left Sudan, the debt was $51 billion. This, this $39 billion did not reflect in my education, access to health care or ticket or even ticket to art galleries. The, jet, the debt originated from private lenders backing the oil industry, so according to neoliberal, bad investment, and Western countries backing Sudan because of the Cold War stance, or to be accurate, paying local tyrannies to kill communists and cut the way for socialist revolution. Interest rates entirely created an increase in the debt, money that doesn't exist, but I still have to pay it back. According to that, debt is not only the foundation of my practice, but also of my very existence and the material access enabling me to realize this practice. In my last project, I researched what I called the object of austerity, tracing the political relation underlying the collective refusal of indebted society, the refusal of a structural adjustment program, and the refusal of the austerity imposed by the debt guardian, from the IMF to the local tyrants. The first imposing the state abandonment of collective ownership of land and service through privatization and liberalization, and the latter using the, the first mentioned lethal power tools produced by the creditor themselves. The object of austerity tells us about the commonalities of the global anti-debt movement and shows some of the static of the movement that tries to shape the new world, a movement similar to the one of the Haiti's 19th century. The primordial debt and debt conscious may be altered, transformed, or dismantled through artistic practices, but the institutional practice maintained the suppression. In 1960, the morality of settler colonialism was crumpling and the world was moving into a new stage, but still the IMF, regarded as International Monetary Fund, dis disregard pressure for by the United Nations, issuing millions of US dollars um, to Portugal and apartheid South Africa for their colonial project maybe altering the possibilities of dismantling this institution itself could also be considered an artistic practice. As I witnessed the gathering in Tahrir Square and I watched a video from Chile and Burkina Faso and I have joined the organizing group from Sudan, I have seen a creation of low tech and the appropriation of a high tech as a political and artistic practice. The hitting of cooking pots in Lebanon and Chile in the night of curfews, a method of moving sound installation or the re-sculpting of oil barrels symbolize the Iraqi movement, dancing with the tear gas and creating necklaces from the empty canisters. Maybe if we flipped the map one time, we could learn about the new practices and new politics of the collective refusal. Perhaps these movements are in the stage of defeat or transforming into a debt guardian itself, but can still learn something new from this process of negation. That's a wonderful and very succinct, but so evocative uh, set of um, ideas that you presented. Thank you. Um, Bahar, maybe let's go to you and then... Thank you, uh, Max, for the introduction, for the uh, presentations that uh, Ahmed, um, I have to say the stakes of your prompt, the question of unpayable debt, especially in relation to our artistic practice, um, has haunted me since reading your email, maybe because the immediate affective response um, in the moral economy of debt, as Graeber talks about, is guilt. But I'll try to address your prompts as best as I can, given this limited time. Um, here I want to foreground the word weird as a concept underlying some of the work I'm involved with at the moment, namely the online project that you talked about, Weird Economies. Um, it can be seen as a site for discussions around unorthodox economics or non-economic social practices in a post-disciplinary space as well as an archiving and programming space and a knowledge infrastructure, and many friends who've uh, labored on it are actually presenting at the symposium these two days. Um, I will discuss three figurations of the weird, like the three wayward or weird sisters in Macbeth in relation to finance capitalism and the debt regime, 
Ultimately, I want to weave the idea of mutual indebtedness into unpayable debt as one way of leveraging a viable mode of interaction with debt, of risking and taking on a social debt. Um, so one, Mark Fisher describes the allure of the weird and the eerie to be a fascination for the outside. Um, over the course of modernism, two entities become the perfect reference for a fascination with the outside of time, finance and art. Um, economics in the past couple of centuries has embarked on a perverse quest to capture and control this exteriority. Um, at the frontiers of the Enlightenment subjects, Promethean project that seeks to capture and seize everything is the colonization of realms beyond the present. The question of time at the center of economic information was augmented in Friedrich Hayek's later work until it reached its occult status. It was not knowledge, but the absence of knowledge, the ontological impossibility of accessing this knowledge in advance that underlies economic activity. The Hayekian knowledge-non-knowledge -knowledge dichotomy, uh, then making a transition from the realm of epistemology to ontology, was no more concerned with economic psychology, as was previously theorized in the work of his antecedents. The economists who took this challenge to heart emerged primarily out of the Cal's commission based at the University of Chicago. Um, Cal's economists strongly opposed Hayek's cognitive theories and for the same reason were committed to overrule his metaphysics of the market with more enhanced information pragmatism. Um, it was in Chicago that the neo neoclassical science of economy, which was popular at the time in the U.S., was married to the neoliberalism of Hayek and the ilk through a subtle appendage. The introduction of advanced probability theory and Bayesian statistics through the emerging field of game theory. So that the shadow of the future surfaced into economics, uh, economics as a numerical factor has directly to do with this chaotic feud with the Hayekian market unconscious. This unholy alliance between American econometrics, itself an uncanny twin of Soviet cybernetics, in fact, with the early day neoliberal philosophy resulted in the contemporary monster child that we call neoliberalism, which is a mishmash of idealist battles over, over information. The early day market theories were far more mystical and esoteric than today's industries of the future. Insurance, hedging, forecasting, etc. The sciences of calculation of the future, borrowing their formulas from orthodox thermodynamics and classical physics, as many have noted, are bereft of nature itself as the primary input of their forms of calculus. The rituals of measurement act as self-fulfilling prophecies, congealing and totalizing the future as a reality, as something here and now, rather than placed within the territory of the unknowable. To loop something into existence is the shared modality of rituals and derivative instruments alike. The recursive movement between debt and credit via the constant flows of liquidity spanning the gift and ritually organized societies till the present. The weird is also another word for looping. Uh, Timothy Morton writes, weird from the old North Urt, meaning twisted in a loop. The Norns entwine the web of fate with itself. In the term weird, there flickers a dark pathway between causality and aesthetic dimension between doing and appearing, a pathway that dominant Western philosophy has blocked and suppressed. Two, Fisher further elaborates on the weird as a particular kind of anxiety. It involves a sensation of wrongness. A weird entity or object is so strange that it makes us feel that it should not exist, or at, le at least it should not exist here. Yet if the entity or object is here, then the categories which we have up until now used to make sense of the world cannot be valid. The weird in this sense creates a rift in the models of thought or in categories of the old. Massive financial crisis of the past decades shake the grounds of our forecasting models to reveal that they only apply as long as the context they arise from remains identical. Or as Eddie Ayer says, they are a change of context, and that is only relative to a given context that we can make causal predictions at all. 
In other words, capturing the end of the undead capital in a fugitive glimpse at the moment of the stock market crash signals a change of context from one reality setting to another. As the threat of an imminent and immense illiquidity event is unleashed, the invisible infrastructures of circulation are writ large. As Marina Wischmidt writes, crisis makes circulation visible. When circulation freezes, it becomes visible. Lastly, three, the weird as a sense of being haunted by a foreign agency. Who or what is it that cannot or will not explain what it is doing or why it is doing it? Or as Martin Koning say, uh, says, why do we keep doing this? Why do we keep offering up our surplus? The absence of the puppet master that works through us turns us into ruins. Discussing the ruins of the colony and the function of memory, Ashir Mbembe writes, in certain canonical black texts, the colony appears foremost as a site of loss, which in turn makes it possible to demand that the ex-colonizer pay a debt to the ex-colonized. The weird is a glitch, a form of ontology required to bring us into the waking life of our bodies as reserves of debt. So, um, these three descriptions of the weird help me locate derivative politics that are separate from or take advantage of instruments currently in the service of predatory practices of future extraction exemplified by finance. If the end of capital cannot be imagined before the end of the world, maybe we should imagine the end of the world as a precondition for the end of capital. The climate catastrophe is that communal limit experience that can orient us towards modes of financial activism that can go along other strategies of refusal or compromise. What's at stake is pursuing forms of justice-seeking justice activism that work through our current economic systems, trying to forge a politics of mutual indebtedness with the shift from the individual to the individual subject of finance. That is, as a house is dissected and reassembled into a bundle of collateral debt obligations, a body and its cognitive capacities is dissected and partitioned into part-time job obligations. As sociologist and dancer Randy Martin says, creating the world in the image of commodities made it possible to imagine what it would mean to take collective possession of the means of production. Recognizing the world crafted through the operations of derivatives leads towards the entangled constitution of mutual indebtedness, of the ways that we are social together, even if we never fuse as one. This is the essence of what we are trying to exercise at Weird Economies. In admittedly very abstract terms, as much as it can be condensed in 10 minutes, we are still an infant of a project, or in Silicon Valley terms, still in the beta version mode. Um, in the spirit of indebtedness, I will end on um, sharing a few of our inspirations in thinking about the politics of debt and forms of financial activism. Recent financial philosophies and radical practices have pointed out possibilities to use the techniques of finance to subvert and reverse finance's own tendency to widen the accumulative effects of past racial, colonial, and economic injustice. In regards to the formation of new political subjectivities, Michel Feher describes practices of counter-speculation or speculative insurgency in the current reputational regime. More specifically, he describes this program to be the political work of investing and raising the credit worthiness of discredited subjects and forms of knowledge. In a social realm entirely predicated on a reputational regime and politics of credibility, how can the art system lend itself to social experimentations around theories of financial justice? A campaign like Strike MoMA which targets the toxic philanthropy of museum's leadership is a good case in point of such investee activism in the field of art. Building on the past instances of museum boycotts and strike campaigns in the US and elsewhere, Strike MoMA works on changing the image of what's previously taken as reputable and credible engagement with art institutions. Or as Feher says, far from sacrificing substance to symbolism or concentrating on symptoms to the detriment of structural inequalities, 
These movements reckon with the fact that the allocation of moral, social, and financial credit has become the decisive stake of social struggles. And lastly, Robert Meister's theorization of historical justice and reparations as a financial option um, is another option. He writes, capitalism is an injustice compounding machine that must be reprogrammed in order to channel its virtualized form of wealth into social value, which is currently held hostage to the maintenance of the machine itself. We must thus reverse the discipline of payments by exacting a price from finance for the injustice it perpetuates. The price of justice at the times of economic crisis, according to Meister, is the price of the liquidity premium that governments pay to bail financial institutions, that is to delay the option of revolution. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bahar. That's uh, a very brilliant and, and wonderfully framed um, tour of, of, of a fascinating spectrum of thinking and, and wonderful examples too. So thank you for bringing that to us today. Uh, Gary, let's go to you. Thank you everyone so far. So in my work for a while, I've been thinking a lot about temporal conflicts. In one sense, how financialization has meant laboring under this illusion that many conflicts have been resolved through the medium of price, and that price determines value and not the other way around. Or in other words, the way in which price becomes risk and risk is the kind of metric by which finance tends to map the universe. Um, this illusion wears quite thin once you start to explore things like unpayable debts, which can never fit onto the ledger, or else the whole game has to change. On one hand, colonialism, the slave trade, genocide and extractivism. On the other hand, the IMF, the US Treasury, and all the debts which would trigger the collapse of the entire international system if those debtor nations were to decide to default collectively. There is also a kind of material dimension here, which um, I was only recently uh, learning about the fact that um, in, when Marx calls Britain the vampire of the earth, there is a kind of more literal aspect to that where during the imperial periods, not only did Britain um, plunder all of the nitrogen and fertilizers from the lands of the colonies, but actually there were also these bone mills in Hull, which were take all of the bodies and, and the bones from the um, battlefields, from the Napoleonic Wars, and grind those into fertilizer too. So there's this kind of very material dimension to how time and matter gets, has been rearranged into now these debts which may be considered externalities. So as Graeber showed, um, debt is not only what the weak owe the strong, but also at times what the strong owe the weak. Like in the case of US Treasury bonds, I mean, the world's top holder of these bonds is Japan, a kind of US protectorate in the scheme of things, but the second highest is actually China. So on unpayable debts, there's this, the first thing that Max's prompt made me think of is this great novel called um, Christy Mowry's Own Double Entry, uh, which is by the British writer B.S. Johnson from the 70s. It's about this kid, Christy, who's been loafing around and decides to become a bank clerk and learns about the double entry bookkeeping system. He gets all sorts of exploits and keeps a ledger between him and the world. It's actually called a ledger that's, uh, a ledger that's head, headed Christy Mowry in account with them in caps. So he credits the universe for things like small kindnesses from Joan because the girl at work smiled at him, or 30 pounds is debited because there's a bad atmosphere at work, or 55 pounds because his supervisor lacks sympathy, and another 60 pounds debited from the universe because he hasn't learned any secrets today. As time goes on, the stakes get higher, and Christie causes the death of 20,000 innocent West Londoners at the end of the novel. He compensates the universe 26,000 pounds. But likewise, he debits his counterparty 325,000 pounds because socialism wasn't given a chance. Perhaps we can think of unpayable debts as a kind of broken contract. 
if we move us if we move aside from the kind of moralizing resonances of debt, what we end up seeing is a social fabric consisting of powerfully asymmetric creditor debtor relations. But any loan is also about accepting the risk of a default. The philosopher Akili Mbembe, who Baha just mentioned, observed recently in an interview, it may be that we must give up on the dream of reconcilability. It may be that those dreams are so antagonistic that they can never be reconciled. The question is then, is it at all possible to build anything in common in the face of such agonism? Do we, leave, or do we live with irreconcilability? What kind of life is likely to emerge out of conflictive opinions and positions that will never be reconciled? And how can we live with them without opening up the doors to civil war? A civil war not only within specific nation states, but a civil war at planetary scale. I think that's where we probably are. Uh, end of quotes. So to me, the question of refusal um, of unpayable debts is something like the question of how to live with irreconcilability. But it's not a static ledger. It feels something more like an effervescent foam, where these narrative conflicts, temporal conflicts, are splitting into so many new worlds all the time. Some of them are enclaves, some of them are communes, all in some way of manifestations of refusal, whether through opting out, of, uh, opting out or structural, ex yeah, structural exclusions from the social contract. Perhaps one of the ironies here is that this illusion of resolution that I spoke about in the beginning of reconcilability, which, never have been, which may never have been there in the first place, was in part an effect of financialization. This idea that there would be a global ledger of settlements and arbitration that largely emerged out, uh, out of the post-war order. And so in that recon irreconcilability, the refusal of one world takes you into another, another episteme, another geography, another concept of value, another model of community. The refusal of one reality becomes the acknowledge acknowledgement of multiple interoperating realities, a kind of whole of mirrors reality. There are many back doors, underground tunnels, elevator shafts, and so on, but there is no backstage. I mean this metaphorically, but also in some ways culturally and materially. We're now seeing this proliferation of narrative technologies, the building of law, of conspiracy theory, and world building more generally, whether for power or survival, as a result of these temporalities and these layers of indebtedness clashing against one another. So I suppose once you find yourself backing, once you find out that backing out of one world lands you in another, it becomes less a binary between refusal and assimilation, voice and exit, and something more like arbitrage. The construction of mechanisms, concepts, or even communities that interface between these different economies, temporalities, or worlds. Ideally, and ideally, artistic and conceptual practices can be tools in this construction, but they are not necessarily emancipatory. They're just potential tools for this kind of hyperstition because they are not very productive and highly promiscuous practices. Bruno Latour has been developing this theme recently with the idea that we don't live on the same planet. And you can see this kind of literally, for example, in the temporality of the planet and the market, which are effectively representations of completely different worlds by now, in which the phenomena of nature are viewed quite literally as un uncorrelated with the phenomena of the market. In some cases, climate risk is even understood as a good hedge for portfolio diversification, as in the case of catastrophe bonds. And you, may, uh, and you have the way in which all this power is accruing above and below the level of the state into community enc enclaves, as well as oligarch city-states but also at supranational networks of financial and informational power. So, uh, so I suppose my practice is interested in the opening and closings of worlds. What interests me is the way in which structures of desire hold them together and carry across them. I once spoke to a friend working at the Center for Existential Risk in Cambridge as a researcher assessing all kinds of catastrophic planetary risks. Because I've been talking to some people working in insurance and catastrophe modeling, I asked them whether in their work they were in dialogue with the insurance industry. 
since we were similarly involved in the business of quantifying climate risk and the like. He told me that they occasionally had contact, but the research ends where the insurance industry's research begins. Oh, sorry, rather. The insurance industry's research ends where the catastrophe uh, existential risk research's uh, research begins, because that's the point after which there is no more society, no more economy. One world has ended. A last note on worlds, I mean, in another sense, the super rich are already the first to exercise a form of refusal by removing themselves from the infrastructures and public goods that materially constitute the fabric of society. Um, just another note on the second point that Max made on the aesthetics of refusal. There is something I find a little bit difficult within the aesthetics of refusal, which is that it can end up with a kind of subjective moral authority. If refusal is grounded in solidarity, in a kind of mass default, a jubilee, where you tear apart the terms and conditions, that's great. But when you take on, uh, when you, you take up refusal on the level of subjective representation, especially when it's done by artists, it can also be trickier. I suppose my point is that everyone has it in them to feel dispossessed, to find righteousness within systemic injustice, and we should be by default suspicious of that feeling, not because it isn't true, because it needs to be grounded in some kind of concrete sociality and solidarity. Otherwise, all too often, refusal starts to look more like an abdication. I'm thinking in part of the mimetic power of resentiment, which is kind of everywhere today, where every new grasp at power is framed as a radically countercultural act, some kind of revenge of the dispossessed. As it turns out, things are pretty shit and almost everyone feels dispossessed. And when things feel bad, never mind the violence is structurally ill-distributed. The revolutionary salvos of crypto and the ownership economy are a good example I'm thinking of in here in part, which increasingly reads like a sort of post-millennial revenge fantasy for being deprived of property on the ship a generation before. In a way, you can read the internet and the history of American technology as a certain history of trauma in that way. And so, at the risk of cringingly quoting our previous speaker, um, Olufemi Otaiwa actually wrote a great piece in which um, he spoke about, contrary to the old expression, pain, whether born of oppression or not, is a poor teacher. Suffering is partial, short-sighted, and self-absorbed. We shouldn't have a politics that expects different. Oppression is not a prep school. And very finally, I mean, I think we should go on because I've taken up too much time, but um, um, on the mechanisms and tools and the economy of refusal, I mean, I think I'm, I'm sort of a co-conspirator with, with Baha here in terms of wanting to think through um, the forms of, I think of it as temporal engineering that might be available within finance, whether it's through in very practical ways, like the kinds of leverage and pipelines that can be built to reclaim this relation of indebtedness. So for example, pension fund activism would be a very large, obvious one. And, uh, and also this kind of um, various forms of sabotage. I mean, that people like Kim Sandy Robinson and um, Andreas Malm have been talking about lately, as well as within Michelle Feher's argument, um, this idea that because of the deeply speculative, deeply reputational uh, economy that we're in, where we're all just speculating on each other's speculations, that is where narrative forms, as well as structures of desire and, and memes, in a sense, uh, that such as divestment campaigns, actually do have quite a powerful, um, greater form of leverage than they used to within a more kind of traditional form of capitalism. Um, but I think all of these are like, practical tools that I want to, I, I, I guess I want to consider my work more. Um, because in terms of the kind of artistic side, I mean, I, I always go back to that uh, Deleuze and Guattari quote, which is that uh, no one has ever, ever died of contradictions. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's a very important quote, I think. Um, thank you all, all four of you for these phenomenal um, contributions I feel like the the conversation we're having now is one I've I've been dreaming of being part of for a long time so thank you for all uh, helping make this dream a bit of a reality um, I, I want to encourage those of you who are watching uh, at home or at work 
or at that strange space between home and work that everyone seems to be in right now, uh, that you are welcome to go to the telegram and pose questions, which then through a magical process, I will be able to relay to our panelists. Uh, on your screen, there's, there's information about that and also wherever you're streaming this. Uh, and for those of you who are watching it after the event actually takes place, I encourage you to invest in time travel and hopefully you'll be able to come back and join us at some point in the future, which is also the past. Um, meanwhile, however, I want to uh, invite those speakers who, who a, a number of our speakers already sort of prefigured or began to answer this question I had next about art, art and aesthetics. Um, and I want to invite other speakers to maybe speak about that a little bit. I would be very interested in hearing um, what, uh, what you're thinking about this. I mean, all four of you are in some sense artists. And I think the, one of the conditions of financialization uh, is that this thing that we used to understand as the artist is no longer as reliable a descriptor as it once was. Uh, perhaps it's simply because the economy itself is getting so weird, or perhaps it's simply because the the processes of financialization have collapsed certain uh, habits of thought that we had about what is material and what is representational. This thing we call the artist has become something quite strange. So I, I, if you want, uh, each of you, I'd be curious to learn from you either on, a, on an abstract theoretical level or simply on the level of your own practice, why you have chosen to pursue a critique of finance and financialization uh, through this thing we once maybe called art. Um, and here I want to introduce a uh, is something that uh, Rachel brought up this morning, which is that this terminology of refusal that we've been asked to think through uh, together here at this symposium, you know, has a beautiful polyvalence in English. I mean, on one hand, it has that meaning that we all recognize, which is to say no, essentially, um, and to say no in many ways. Uh, but then it also has that wonderful connotation to it of refusing, of bringing something back together. And, and here I'm thinking about some of the things we've just heard about the, the ways in which the new financialized world system, maybe it's not actually all that new, uh, but the financialized world system we find ourselves in is bringing us together and bringing people together in ways that we might not have been taught to um, anticipate before. Um, for you, and you can choose to answer this question or not, or, or circumvent it if you want, I'm curious if you're seeing these new forms of refusing, these new forms of people coming together. I think we've already been, that you've, uh, a number of you have already alluded to this. Um, and if those forms of refusal, of coming together and fusing differently, uh, are moving beyond a common politics of the no, of refusal, and if if we can see in them some sort of potential yes, or potentially many yeses, or potentially something beyond no and yes as well. And here, I, I, I would like to maybe start with Dele again, uh, and I, I would be curious if you could share some of the perspectives of the work you're doing in, in Lagos and elsewhere in West Africa as well, if, if you want to. Yeah, th thank you. Um, it's been brilliant to hear um, everyone's comments and very um, uh, thought-provoking uh, the, uh, there's I want to I want to think about um, or touch on the, the point of derivatives and just as you were discussing there you know there's been a lot of um, fascination within um, derivative financial instruments since the crash of uh, or the Great Recession in 2007-2008 and as Randy Martin discusses, the, the derivative is also um, something that produces a kind of uh, mutual precarity. And through his practice as a, uh, also a dancer, not just a sociologist, but a dancer, he, he draws a relation between, between the two, the, the dance, the, the idea of the precarious dance being um, a practice um, a rehearsal of a kind of society of um, mutual indebtedness. But the derivative isn't a, a, a new instrument. Uh, I, I argue in, in some of my work that um, the, way, the ways in which um, the enslaved, the, the credit that was, the credit in insurance instruments designed um, to um, protect 
the slave voyages and and the merchants from um, Los also put um, the enslaved body as a form of uh, a derivative by guaranteeing um, by guaranteeing the value of the enslaved body um, against um, against loss during the journey. In reality, the the enslaved body was becoming um, a financial derivative, and this is a point that um, that um, Ian Balcom also makes in, when he discusses um, um, the the African consumer, the early African consumer within this um, burgeoning um, uh, financial system. He talks about the the African body being a species of money, and this is um, a species of money, a form of credit, a fungible credit. So we see, um, you know, carrying through into today where we talk about um, the African um, populations and demographics um, as a huge potential or huge well of human capital. We see that the, the very bodies are, are what is producing um, the value or what the value is being hedged against. And as I was discussing, it's producing a kind of paradox in which this, this unpayable debt is also producing um, super, super dispossessed bodies. And so, when I'm highlighting um, this, these youth movements, um, all the all they have um, um, is is their body. When um, everything else has been stripped, um, um, a lot of the, the urban youth are turning to the body as as a means of um, capital, as a means of creating. Um, as a means of creating um, some some form of income, and we see this very much in in kind of um, uh, urban culture and Afrobeats culture and the dance movements that that are happening happening today. You know, we we see you know the the various different um, you know on TikTok and and YouTube and and Instagram and all these different um, kind of social media channels. We see um, young people developing um, a following for themselves by using dance in particular and dance trends as a way, as a means of, um, first of all, developing credit, so developing their credit worthiness by developing a follower, a followers and uh, following. But in that process, they're also attracting um, uh, opportunities for themselves. But they're also building building community, and for me, this is what what's super interesting because the communities that they're building are not necessarily based on financial exchange. They're based on um, creative exchanges that that are that are ongoing. So the the young people that I'm working with, so I've I've um, for the past few years have been making um, films. Whilst I'm whilst I'm researching, uh, particularly in in Lagos, and particularly within a community called Orun Shoki, um, and the young people there are they, they're developing festivals, um, which is attracting attention to the, to themselves. But they're also, you know, they're they're developing um, a community in which they're mutually indebted to each other. They're creating opportunities for themselves, but it's not necessarily based around um, uh, uh, financial exchanges. And this is, this is the, the culture and this is the um, tactics that were then reapplied in the political realm when they started the NSARS movement. So the very same young people who are organizing themselves in creative groups have all, have now realized the potential, the political potential of those skills that they've learned in 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 essentially surviving um, through this kind of creative um, survival circuit that they're they're building for themselves within 
within the city. So for me, this is where the real kind of opportunity to intervene politically is. Um, if we can um, engage with these kind of um, cultures um, and, and build on that, I think there's a huge, huge potential for um, impactful forms of refusal. You might have a comment that follows directly on that from your, your observations and thinking about revolts in the eastern part of Africa. Yeah, yeah actually, it's like what I was saying here. And also, I think that the creative processes that with the collective refusal is already happening, that it's looked at it as a kind of a crisis. But also, I would also want to go back a little bit to to, to, to abandon proposals uh, or proposals that have been happening. I think you have the proposal of, of Walter Rodney, for example, of, um, of uh, cutting the way or like breaking, breaking the relationship with the financial past and creating new. Uh, somehow, we, but when we say financialization of economy now, it's also happening now in East Africa, also happening in most of the countries that, that we kind of, saying also there's no producers anymore mm. uh, the neglection of producers especially especially in the ruler um the producing the surplus that actually saying all the world is built on speculations but there is somebody who's producing commodities somewhere <laughs> and and somehow the engagement of that of of this group in a political process have been neglected for a while and i'm thinking about this this is what dragged me to financialization without also going the new classic practices or re repeating it, but, but trying to, to visit these places. Also, what is the value of the body, which actually Dele mentioned, the value of the body that um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, our financial space. And I think this is what's realized by this, what we call it um, urban revolutions that's happening now. It's a movement of, of the children of finance. Uh, it's actually the, the kids of the, of the service sector um, they're actually leading this movement because there is some kind of um, an empty space uh, or like a, a kind of no verbalization of, of the self yet, not understanding ourselves in the new economy that emerging. So this is the places where I actually my practice come to. And then I saw that through the process of revolt, this like when these buddies come to each other, I think they produce narrative and they produce static and they produce uh, discourse and poetry itself that if we look at it in the framework of a conflict as happened as a result of the falling of the financial system, we were not able to unfold and learn from it because we look at it as a crisis that expected. But if we look at it as well as a process that there is a lot of production and discourse and solution proposals as the same fight of the anti-colonial fight of Sankara or Walter Rodney or, or the other proposals that we come to it now. I say in the recent time, when environmental discourse emerging, people started to revisit the Malikal Cabral work. And, and, and it is some kind of an interesting thing that looking at all of this material that he produced and also the collective refusal, it's not actually the collective refusal, but he did something that we actually are not talking about in our planet anymore. He, he offered the compromise uh, and, and, and he offered the compromise. And this is story maybe actually, I just tell very fast is in Malikal Cabral, for example, he was offering the Portuguese um, uh, colonial authorities in type of production, how they can produce sugar peas and produce in Portugal itself instead of extracting it from the colonies in Guinea-Bissau or Cabo Verde. And this is proposed itself, it's like like the extraction, the expansions, the degrowth was actually proposed in the in the decolonial process. And if we if we see the, the, the visiting of the anti-colonial movement as just like um, we visit them now as the as a, uh, an important um, literature production that happened in that time. We look at it as history, uh, and in that time it's been seen as a conflict. And now we look at the movement of the 2019, 2011, if you call it Arab Spring and Global South and what's happening in Chile, what's happening in Haiti as well, still now and what happened in Burkina Faso and, uh, and, and Zimbabwe. And it's not all has a political shape, but there is certain kind of a static literature proposal happening that we don't see just like as the falling of the world finance as a proposal of change uh, of uh, imagining the end of the world because the imagination of the end of the world is a uh, is could be the proposal if we could imagine the end of 
capitalism after it, as you said. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this. Um, I want to bring in, just because you opened up a, a wonderful space to talk about it by speaking about uh, Cabral, that we have a question um, from from Telegram that asks about, can we find hints of degrowth theory in David Graver's fragments of an a uh, anarchist anthropology, and would it work for global models of de-escalating and... Um, the pressures, economic, ecological, perhaps as an alternative to this thing we're calling financialization. And I really appreciate you bringing in this this question that Cabral, uh, you know, uh, and, and the agrarian question, you know, and, and also you bring in the industrial question as well. It's easy when we think about sort of tertiary, even fourth order economies to forget these deeply material elements. And I also just want to bring into our discussion here um, also the work of Joshua Clover, on riot strike riot where he, he essentially argues that you know in a time of financialization when the when the the most profitable element of capitalist uh, accumulation is in the financial sector you begin to see r riots as the main form of um of an urban riots as a kind of protagonism from below um, and and the, the invention of new forms of social relations from below are happening in these kind of streets. Whereas in moments when industrial production and, and the extraction of surplus value in that more classical sense, that you might see that more with industrial strikes and that sort of thing. Um, let's, let's go to Bahar. Bahar, what are you thinking about um, this question of art or some of the things you've heard in this latest round? Yeah, I think I can speak to the art uh economy um, condition at the moment. Um, I mean, one thing to, so there are many considerations, but um, I think one thing that we can start from is that the art peripheries are already kind of, you know, the art system is already gentrified of its, you know, peripheries. So the fact that you're involved as a professional in art is already, you know, a marker of like extreme privilege, like in the context that, uh, I, I grew up in Iran and with you know the lack of access to public funding structure or private funding structure uh, or any access to like global institutions, citizenship visas, like you're completely outside the planet of art. Um, so starting from this point, the question of refusal, I think you know we start from this idea of now we're talking about an extremely privileged class in the institutionalized form of art. Of course, there are many practices as um, everyone on the panel was talking about. Um, if we want to talk from this space, then we can really like consider the stakes and the risk involved in um, um, making different propositions. And I think something that I'm trying to think through um, through it with Feher is, um, for example, the recent, you know, uh, strike actions and boycott actions against like mega institutions. Like maybe a few years ago, it would have been seen more in a cynical light that, oh, these are temporary or like, how do you deal with it in this instance and not like another this instance. But as we are seeing is that they are actually gaining some traction as much as um, you know, um, they become like some kind of a PR buzz generating machines and as long as they understand um, how they're working on the level of image production and that's what we are doing in, you know, with these means that are given to us. We are circulating images on a planetary scale uh, which some people come across, some people don't, but still we have like these resources at our disposal to um, to generate different images. And the image of refusal that's produced through these, you know, these strike actions itself may be something to um, to cherish in terms of how they're kind of leading into like. Um, now we see that they're actually piling up into, you know, other forms of refusal institutionally or other. So this is where I think speaking of aesthetics of refusal, I think coming to the financialized times, um, um, there is a way that the aesthetics can be leveraged in terms of like affecting what's um, real, like Ahmed was saying, like there are producers on the ground. So the question is how can the aesthetics um, go back to leverage what's happening um, on the ground. Uh, Gary, does that re resonate with what you're thinking? 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it's some of the things that we spoke about certainly at least have like you know, the same causes for optimism that we have these days. And I suppose refinancialization in I'm for me it became about looking for forms of systemic agency that were already maybe emerging or already kind of implied by existing situations. Um I just jotted a few notes on on the kinds of things that I was thought of as people were speaking. I mean, um, in relation to um, uh, Dede, you spoke about the um, the returning to to the body when there's nothing else left, and also the kinds of um, the way in which you, know, you can suddenly suddenly access this, let's say, global TikTok audience or something like this. In terms of to this, I guess it's about the kind of instrumentalization of representation within a certain kind of like um, digital and semiotic kind of economy, and especially as far as I understand the role of um, African dance that plays in that is really interesting as well um, in terms of um, becoming this in, within this kind of uh, meme economy. But what it also made me think of is this kind of very polyvalent form of assetization that I think is happening across and has been happening across culture. And it's not necessarily uh, good or bad, I'm not sure. I think that the, one of the questions that refusal brings to me is like, can you refuse and which do you refuse in, in relation to this kind of financialization? Like to be, to be clearer, because it does, it changes the shape of things. It rearranges the order of things sometimes. To be clear, one of the examples I'm, I, I was thinking of a while ago is the role of fandoms these days, and especially the role of uh, fandoms, which is increasingly seem to take on the object of the adulation as something more like an asset, like a kind of avatar in the world, which they can at times discipline or at times use to, to you know, to, to, it's it's almost like taking you know like a Japanese mecha, but it's like Gwyneth Paltrow being controlled by like twenty thousand diehard kind of goop fans or something. Like there's a kind of um, because of the, the the forms of pseudonymity that happen in the digital economy because of the attention and the the forms of reputation are so critical to. And I'm talking here very much of obviously of this. Um, more ethereal layer of things. This is and, and that, which is not taught to, to kind of say that this is the economy and the the, the forces of production and, and the, even just the commodity trade and all of these other things aren't happening, right down to the soil. But anyway, the the the, the role of this kind of this kind of assetization um, seems to have an interesting agency today, which you can see. Um, I mean, not least, you can see VCs, like venture capitalists out there mining for 21-year-old fresh grads to be like new scouts into the future. Like how can we kind of mine the future for the trends and like how can these kids become influencers and then be the trends and that, that we will then reap later. So there's this, um, uh, I mean, and, and uh, on the uh, Craven side, I mean, um, and you talked about riots. I mean, I've been looking very much into the insurance industry recently and, you know, there's a in, uh, increase increasing interest as well in um, a category of reinsurance for um, riots and civil unrest, which is perhaps not surprising. <laughs> and you can get bonds of various kinds, which are very high yield in that as a kind of um, uh, hedge against the, 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 the otherwise smooth functioning of the world. Um, so yeah, I, I, I suppose the way, the, the way that I, I, I come to this kind of financialization stuff um, is to think about, I think, what we've all tried to, uh, I, I sort of imagine that we're all trying to kind of discover is like outside of idealistic speculation, which art has been guilty of for a very long time, where can you find the existing or emergent shapes of, you know, tools, tools that, or, or, or phenomena that could actually mean something outside of, um, yeah, these, these kinds of kind of echelons, bubbles of the art world. Thank you all for these um, these responses. Um, I'm just going to bring in a quick uh, comment, which is uh, somebody from the audience asked us, can we think of debt in a quantum way? Debt not as a quantity, but as entanglement, as emptiness and relationships. Can't it be thought of as a thing, uh, as a thing in itself? 
uh, which I think actually quite resonates with something that I think we've we've spoken about in the last few minutes, which is the way that um, this world of debt and financialization, these this which are sort of the the dark and the light side of the moon in some ways of global capitalism, uh, that it it puts us into these new kinds of relationships that are not that don't map in a kind of uh, the the kind of economic physics. That's a bit of a strange formulation, but there's, you know, there's a Newtonian sort of notion about like debts and credits and the ledger and the double entry bookkeeping and all that. But I think uh, to bring back Randy Martin's work, which has been mentioned and some of the work that's come out of it, there's this sense that the world is being recomposed by these financial forces. Or maybe, maybe better to say we are now recognizing that the world has, or, you know, modernity, capitalist led white supremacist colonial modernity has always been composed by these financial forces. And now we're coming to recognize it. And these forces Forces are bringing us together and, and making us recognize our kind of incredible deep entanglements, whether it's through the way in which our world is reflected through the insurance industry or the way in which new formulations of resistance manifest themselves seemingly spontaneously in the streets that seem to come out of nowhere. Um, and here I want to bring us to the to the kind of third piece, uh, which is this question of what it, what it means to have an economy of refusal. Um, and I'm going to invite you all to, and, and we have about 10 minutes left, so I'll ask you to keep your comments quite short here, but to offer us maybe some thoughts about uh, this question of what it means to create an economy together. Uh, and I'll ask you, uh, I'm, I'm going to move this towards a provocative edge, uh, just for the sake of argument here. And to move us towards that provocative edge, I want to ask, like, do we have to pick between strategies within strategies against or strategies beyond. And by this I mean like we've heard already that in some ways there are strategies within financialization where we begin to appropriate the technologies and the dispositions and the approaches of financialization that have been encoded within us as indebted subjects, as subject of indebted states. How it is the scope of our action to work within those and to try and leverage them towards new ends? Or should we come back and rekindle the spirit of an, of, of an against, let's say, that we were speaking about just a moment ago, that, that, that maybe takes inspiration from earlier moments of sort of revolutionary fervor that demanded not only a better form of capitalism, but the abolition of capitalism, the expropriation of wealth. I mean, here we are in Berlin where there was a referendum a few months ago to expropriate major landlords and a, and a kind of echo of demands that have been made in the past and certainly a counter financial struggle. But this is very much a strategy against, uh, a, or should our strategy be in some way asking for something beyond, asking for a world beyond financialization? I have set up a false trichotomy <laughs> uh, on purpose to bring us to a, a kind of more piquant uh, conclusion here. But, you know, what, what, what do you make of this within, against, and beyond formulation? Does one of these strategies strike you as the most feasible within your context of action? Or, uh, or do we need to somehow bring all three to the table? And let's, uh, let's go back to Dele to, to begin our final round here. Yeah, I was going to actually ask for a moment to, to think about that. Perhaps someone, someone else has an issue. It's okay with you, Gary. Maybe let's go in reverse order that we have before. Um, okay, I mean, that's obviously the, uh, a difficult and also false question. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, take it all. Uh, <laughs> I, I kind of mean it. Like, I think it's, you know, I, I, I don't think that there is a version of against that's not also within and not also beyond anymore in a sense and you kind of have to you you see this kind of shit system mutating i mean i guess maybe the only counterpoint to that is what's interesting to me that's going on is the role of the, the states like the state is both the most kind of completely um bound up and in, in impotent actor as well as the kind of last resort insurer lender uh you know money Ease uh, of the whole system, so there's a, there are um, still different kind of poles. It's not like everything is 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 finance. Um, well, yeah, I'll keep to, to keep it short. I I, I think that um, essentially it's it has to be all three. Thank you, Bahar. Uh, I also keep it very very short. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, agreeing with Gary. I think, I mean, clearly the goal is to go beyond. But uh, what I'm trying to think about is modes of providing instruments, tools, forms of activism with, uh, you know, uh, forces that are clearly much more powerful than what we have at our disposal these days, um, can leverage, uh, you know, more of a, um, um, let's say, like scaled body of people working within their, you know, local conditions to, um, to influence, you know, what's happening to hopefully to go beyond. But um, to get there, we, I think we need to work within for a bit, a bit more. Yeah, actually, yeah, actually I still go in the same, I think. But also, I would also say how you go out of it in order to rethink it, to, to unfold the weird economy and to see how it's unfolded, to analyze it. And you need to be staying inside. And I think the only way to have this an actual fully body refusal, imagination refusal, and sitting outside and imagining the new world, the only way, I think, to take this rocket of, the next rocket of, uh, what's his name? Elon Musk, and then avoid the moon. And that's in that <laughs> place, you could actually look at the world back and, and rethink it. And I hope you can come back. But the only way is to be part of the process of how it's un unfolding. But also, you cannot, it is not impossible to, to leave it. Mm. Yeah, the space of imagination, it is from inside the process. And, um, and that's my short answer to it. But it's the same answer of everybody. <laughs> like, mm. Yeah, um, like the it. risk of the risk of being a little, little bit boring, I, um, I'm on similar line, being a within, against, and a beyond. Um, and I, I think what, what's interesting, though, um, and to kind of go back to some someone who's very inspiring to this way of thinking, Cedric Robinson's work, in Black Marxism, this notion of the the, onto, the ontological totality. This idea that there there's always been a beyond. So, you know, particularly within an African context, there was a before, you know, before um, capitalism, and that has carried and carried down generations. And and so within the kind of cultures and groups that I that I engage with in my work. Um, that that kind of other world also exists within within um, the epistemology of how um, people engage with each other. So that that other world, um, I think, is something that's extremely exciting. Um, it's become uh, more defined, par partially because of the technologies, social technologies of exchange that exist, but also because of the, the pressure, um, the, the loss of the, the state and the pressure to create a community, these other worlds are, that was being beyond capital are becoming more, more I think um, I think that that's kind of an exciting space to engage with. Um, well, it, it falls to me to, strangely on time, uh, draw our fabulous panel to a close. Uh, Dele, Ahmed, Bahar, and Gary, thank you all so much uh, for an incredibly stimulating conversation. Uh, I hope the audience has also found it to be evocative and uh, thought-provoking. And uh, we'll look forward to carrying forward a number of these themes with the rest of the day and the rest of the festival here, or the rest of the symposium, I should say. So uh, there's, there's warm reception from the audience here, and uh, we'll see you next time.